system resolution. I mean, it's just hard to imagine. Picometer meter resolution with uh, electron uh, tychography and where they take the whole, uh, the whole uh, information, not just relying on physical lenses, but the whole information from uh, scattered electrons through uh, transmitted through a material. So uh, Professor Moeller uh, has been working on new electron microscopy methods uh, for atomic scale control and characterization of new materials. Uh, I guess he's originally from Australia, got his bachelor's in uh, Sydney, and then moved on to Cornell where he spent most of his career, uh, though he spent time also at Bell Labs. And uh, he's worked on uh, things ranging from fuel cells and batteries and superconductors to, uh, to uh, uh, ferroelectrics, and, and, which is uh, a very wide range of interesting uh, uh, materials. Uh, one of his most cited papers is this paper on uh, superconducting interfaces between insulating oxides, which has over 2000 uh, citations and is still uh, extremely interesting. And the observation of room temperature polar skirmions in, in ferroelectrics. Yeah, uh, David Moeller is a fellow of the American Physical Society and the Microscopy Society of America, received uh, numerous awards. Uh, it's interesting uh, that he has uh, three world records uh, recognized by Guinness, uh, the highest resolution microscope, the world's thinnest sheet of glass, and the world's smallest robot. So without further ado, we're going to turn over to uh, 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 David Moeller. And uh, afterwards, there will be uh, time for questions and answers. So I'll turn it over now. So you can share your screen. Okay, you'll have to enable screen sharing. Okay. <laughs> I think uh, you have we, to. Uh, Geo, sharing. yeah, Geo, yeah. can you do that? <coughs> okay, good. Now I can do this. Okay, so uh, I'd like to thank everyone um, for being here. I think we're all probably looking forward to getting back in person and not being stuck in Zoom hell. But in the meantime, uh, this is, you know, as Ron said, this is the next best thing. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, looking, looking forward to at least communicating with people because we don't get to chat at conferences. So uh, the, 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 the take home message for today is a little about what does it take to see polar order and some of the more interesting polar order parameters um, with a view in fact towards, you know, what do I have to do if I wanted to see quadrupoles instead of dipoles and higher order things in general. So I'm gonna just, you know, as a taste of things show you, here's a plot of a whole bunch of ferroelectric textures um, in fact, in the same material at different temperatures. And, and this is some work done by my postdoc Yutsun Shao, um, showing you the very rich phase of different ferroelectric states you can get yourself into. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we measure these things, uh, because it turns out that, you know, is not that simple. And definitely there's some things to watch out for. And in talking about how we measure these things, um, one of our methods is fairly brute force and ignorance. It's just imaging the atoms and trying to measure their displacements. And there's a second approach, which is the one that I'm showing you over here. And that is a diffraction-based approach. And that is going to raise some very interesting questions about, in some sense, you know, why in some regions does nature have a well-known left bias uh, that with a single diffraction pattern, we can actually measure a local polar order. Um, and how does nature know which basis set to choose when it makes that measurement? And so there's some interesting things there that maybe will get you thinking a little bit about how we think about polarization um, based on that discussion. So uh, to do this work, I have uh, a lot of collaborators. And in fact, I don't even have listed in the talk here all of my collaborators on ferroelectrics, but I've just picked out you know, a small section of the work that I want to highlight, uh, particularly work, a lot of the work will be by Yotsun Chao, 
uh, Zhen Chen, who are two of my postdocs currently, and then some work previously by Kayla, Megan, uh, and Julia predominantly. And obviously we need good samples, which we get from uh, Ramesh, Daryl, and, and Harold Wong. And we've had some great theory help along the way. And you'll see there's some hardware development that's been done with Sol Gruner's group as I take them from working on x-rays to the dark side. So this talk is gonna be a talk about electron microscopy. And <clears throat> the way we do electron microscopy is we're gonna take an electron beam and we're gonna use an electron lens to focus it down to a spot that's a lot smaller than an atom maybe you know, one angstrom to half an angstrom in size. And then when I scan the beam around, I can get it to scatter from a single column of atoms. And the scattering from close to the nucleus scatters out to large angles. And that gives me a signal that uh, kind of scales like Rutherford scattering. You know, Z squared would be Rutherford scattering from a nucleus. And so it, it's gonna pick out the heavy atoms. So here's a very simple, a gallium oxide structure and this annular dark field imaging picks up basically the gallium atoms, but not the oxygens. I can also collect the smaller angle scattering. Um, and depending how I do it, depends exactly the contrast mechanism, but at the small angles, what happens is the, um, the weighting of the scattering is more like a Z to the two thirds. And now I pick out both the gallium atoms and the oxygen atoms. So this was an oxygen atom that's not really showing up in that image. If I overlay, overlay the two images, you actually get a good feel of where all the atoms are in this binary oxide. So this is sort of a cartoon of our imaging mode of uh, pretending that everything works perfectly, which of course it doesn't. Um, but conceptually, this is sort of a, you know, a starting point to kind of hang your hat on. And so, if you wanna go ahead and you wanna measure ferroelectrics, um, these very fancy microscopes, these are called aberration corrected electron microscopes, um, uh, have enough resolution that you can resolve every atom. And so for about the past 15 years or so, what people have been doing is by directly imaging the atoms in ferroelectrics, you can see small little wiggles of the atoms and this is PZT and that's the uh, zirconium and the one next to it I think is the oxygen. And there's a little wiggle this way and that tells you my polarization points down and there's a little wiggle that way and my polarization points up. This was done by TM. Um, these days we tend to do it more by scanning TM and things look again, fairly similar. This is bismuth ferrite. And, and these are the heavy bismuth atoms and these are the lighter iron atoms. If you look at this little square over here, you can see the iron atom is displaced, right? It's not exactly in the center of the square. You could draw a line there and you can see it's not in the center of the line, it's shifted. And, and uh, as a result, if you measure that displacement of the iron with respect to the four neighboring bismuth atoms, you can draw a little uh, displacement vector that is proportional to the polarization. And, and here's some early work that did this by Chris Nelson and Xiaoxing Pan. And here's a little um, vortex flux closure domain um, in bismuth ferrite sitting on a terbium scandate substrate. And you can kind of draw the arrows of these small displacements and see things happen. Now, the accuracy of this method is normally about five picometers and you're looking for displacements on the order of 10, 20, sometimes 30 picometers. So it's a doable thing, but a little, little noisy. And obviously it's having a little bit of trouble in the substrate, but, but it's enough to kind of map things out. Um, there's a couple of warnings uh, that I do want to point out. Um, he has a, um, a, a material, and if you look at the display, um, apparent position of the atoms plotted out at where they should have been versus where they ended up, there's actually quite a strong thickness dependence to the signal because of electron channeling. And so the atoms can actually sometimes end up in places where you don't expect them to be if the samples get more than 
a few tens of nanometers thick. And this is kind of a warning. And this is a little, you know, as a fundamental issue, you know, if I'm not careful, I, I, I do have some accurate, you know, if I was trying to use this as a displacement of a polarization vector, I actually in the sample got thick enough, I would end up with a sign change. So, you know, we do have to watch out for uh, tilts of the sample and we do have to watch out for thickness variation in how you prepare the sample. Uh, so it's not foolproof, but, you know, under conditions that you'd kind of hope most people are operating, maybe my error bars are, you know, five, 10 picometers. And what I'll talk about later on is how we can actually untangle and do better than and get rid of these kind of errors. But the, there's a lot we can do with the atomic image. I just want to show you, you know, early on how far we can push this. So here is um, one of these hexagonal ferroelectrics. And um, I think this one here is probably obium manganite. Um, and uh, over here, it, it, it's, um, the, if I keep track of the order parentheses, I think of the hybrid improper ferroelectric. But again, the polarization is manifested in this displacement of the heavy erbium atom. And the configurations I can tell for the downstate versus the upstate, if I just look at a bunch of neighbors, uh, these would give me an upstate, those give me a downstate. If I um, wrote down you know, my particular order parameter, I could write down by keeping track of those patterns and I could color code exactly which order parameter I'm dealing with, right? And, and my displacement wave has got an amplitude and a phase uh, to the displacement wave. So Q is gonna tell me how big the distortion is and phi is basically, um, you know, the, the orientation or the, or the uh, you know, and, and both of these, you know, particularly from a topological point of view, phi is going to be an important order parameter. And so what you can do with these measurements now or of these displacements um, is, you know, if you ask yourself, well, what arrangements are energetically favorable? If I write down my old parameter Q as a Q cosine phi and a Q sine phi, and that's my space of where each of these arrangement of atoms might happen to fall, there's in fact an energetically favorable arrangement uh, that, that, you're, that, that you would predict. And if I now look at um, domain walls in erbium manganite, and I look at the local order parameter, so the color code is, um, the color is gonna tell me phi and the saturation of the color is gonna tell me Q. Uh, and if I start to look at all of the atoms in many, many images, they, they um, histogram out uh, to particular points that uh, correlate with the local uh, minima in the free energy diagram. Uh, there are some, particularly when I get near domain walls, uh, and as I approach the domain wall, where obviously I might end up at points that are not a local minimum for what effectively are gonna end up being one of the six stable domain configurations. So um, what's nice is, uh, you know, I take enough statistics and I actually get a sense of what the energy landscape is gonna look like. And so here is some work that my student Megan did um, with uh, Nicholas Gordon's group. And this is a phase plot, and he has the amplitude plot. This is, in fact, a little vortex in the erbium manganite. And you can see over here, my amplitude is going to zero at the core of the vortex. And there's clearly a phase change as I go around the vortex. And this diagram on the right kind of really encapsulates a lot of this behavior of ferroelectrics when I get to small length scales. If I'm a large distance from the vortex, my phase is quantized in steps, which are basically the six domains that I would need to be in to go around the vortex. And if I get close to the vortex, energetically, it's favorable to have a continuum of order parameters. And so around the vortex, you can see it's a smooth line and it's smooth and continuous. So it do, no longer um, has the Z6 symmetry, it's just U1. And a lot of the 
uh, ferroelectric structures we look at, the interesting smooth continuous topologies happen when I make small structures. If I, um, if I have big domains, if I have big layers, in many cases, I'm going to end up with well-defined domains and you'll get the classical flux closure domains uh, that you'd expect from, from Cattell's theory um, back 50, 60 years ago. And the, a lot of the interesting fun structures are when things are small. And so my order parameter is forced to be continuous. Um, sort of on the transition to that, here is some work in lutetium ferrite um, by uh, Megan and Julia. So this is a material that is made up out of lutetium ferrite um, um, 113 and this lutetium ferrite, which is a 124 structure. So the 113 structure is basically um, you know, a layer of iron, a layer of lutetium repeat. And the 124 structure is a double layer of iron. Double layer of iron is um, a little bit of magnetism to it. The 113 is interestingly enough ferroelectric and you can see the little ripples of the uh, lutetium atoms that go with that. Now, the lutetium, the single ion blocks, if I, if I order the structure, so I get a double ion, single ion, right? So this would be what we'd call the, the M equals one structure. It's just a one, 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 repeat. Um, this one, if I start to look at the ordering of polarizations, um, there's, it's basically paraelectric. It hasn't taken on this, any of this lovely multi-well structure that I would get when I'm getting close to bulk-like structure. So when M equals nine, I've actually picked up domains and you can kind of see there's almost like a closure to it that it's, it's, it's trying um, you know, uh, to get a little bit of closure uh, from the ends over there. And then as you, as you go from a big thing, you know, nine or 10 layers, and you go back to one where it's practically all paraelectric, there's an interestingly smooth intermediate phase which you can kind of see um, as we move along and filling stuff around the sombrero, if you like. Um, and eventually I'm forced into the middle of the thing, which is the paraelectric state, which, which again is going to be sort of an interestingly unstable structure. And you can see sort of this kind of thing going on in the M equals two. So this is a nice illustration of sort of where most of the field is today, we try to measure positions of atoms and from the, from the displacement, infer something about the polarization that's attached to that structural displacement. And, and the question you might ask is, well, is that good enough? And when might I need to do better than that? And a lot of the order parameters you might write down from a theory point of view, um, you, you um, often require differential operators. And now when I start to differentiate these polarization maps, they're actually quite noisy. And so, you know, if you take a look at this map and you take away the plots of the displacement of the polarization and you look at the color code, which is the curl, it's actually rather noisy and it has an artificial structure that looks like a cross. And that's actually an artifact, it's not real. Um, so these things get very noisy and we, you know, you can't just Fourier filter away the noise um, because if I take, here's an example of, let me just take band pass filtered white noise, take two derivatives of that, put them together as a vector plot and lo and behold, I now have a Meron structure. And there are in fact a couple of unfortunate papers where people have unfortunately band pass filtered noise and produced structures that look like this. And the clue basically is the width of all the features actually happens to be the width of the, the band pass filter. So you can't get out of this by, by, by averaging and filtering. Uh, you're gonna run into just band pass filtered noise. So how do we do better? And, and there are two ways to do better. And the brute force way is, well, I need to measure the position of the peaks more precisely, which is gonna require higher spatial resolution. So let me tackle that one first. 
And, and to do that, let's understand what's happened to the resolution of electron microscopes over time. Right? The first electron, like microscopy hit its diffraction limit over 100 years ago, electron microscopy started out with a resolution that was relatively poor, but as the wavelength of the electrons went up, the resolution in the microscope went up. And that's because the size of the numerical aperture that I could use without aberrations or blurring was fixed at about 10 milliradians. And so the only way I improve resolution is by shrinking the wavelength. And I can keep doing this by going to higher and higher beam voltages. But at some point that beam voltage gets so high, all of your papers start with the title a radiation damage study of. And that got us close to an angstrom, but not quite good enough to do the kind of ferroelectric mapping you've seen over the last decade. For that, we needed aberration correctors, which opened up the numerical aperture, and in fact, um, have pushed us down to a spatial resolution now of about, point, uh, about half an angstrom. To do better than that, I'm gonna talk about some work by uh, Zhen Chen and Yi Jiang, uh, uh, who, who did the experiment and the theory respectively on this. And that was actually phasing information in diffraction patterns um, to uh, this point should be a little, has shifted over to really be about that. Uh, and what I'm gonna show you is some resolution where we've pushed down into, you know, um, down to about 20 picometers. And at that point, what we're gonna find out, our spatial resolution was in fact limited, uh, not by the microscope anymore, but in fact, by the thermal vibrations of the atoms themselves. So, you know, why has this taken so long to happen? Well, the answer is we need better detectors because electron scattering falls over a huge dynamic range. So um, over the last decade, there have been some great new detectors developed for cryo-EM, and it's led to, uh, well, a huge amount of excitement and eventually a Nobel Prize uh, for cryo-EM because the new detectors allowed them to improve their spatial resolution to surpass that of X-rays. They're in fact now down to about 1.3 angstrom resolution. So by material science standards, pretty bad, but compared to X-rays, pretty good, and compared to the dose they're using, absolutely amazing. So the, the types of detectors that the biologists used are what are called MAPS detectors. And they're great if I need a lot of pixels and I don't need a lot of electrons in each pixel. But if I wanna look at a diffraction pattern, I don't need a lot of pixels for a diffraction pattern, but what I do need is an enormous dynamic range. And so um, the, the sort of detectors that we've focused on uh, are ones emphasizing high dynamic range and can handle as much beam current as you can throw at it. So, um, here is one of our early detectors. And uh, what I'm showing you over here is sort of a cartoon. I have focused the electron beam down to about a nanometer. And so when I look at the diffraction pattern fired through a thin material, you get to see all the diffraction spots. And they're not delta functions because the beam is not infinitely parallel. And this pattern took about a millisecond to record. And if I now scan the beam around and I integrate up the central beam, you get an image that looks like a regular TM image. If I integrate up the scattering around a diffracted beam, then I only get intensity where that diffracted beam is diffracting. And so in this case, what I get to see is the little 2D material. Um, it's a monolayer resting on a silicon nitride support. And obviously only when atoms are oriented at the right angle, do I get to see the diffraction contrast from that small region and it lights up. And if I then go ahead and measure the shift of these diffraction peaks, very quickly, you can start to measure lattice constant variations with a precision of about 0.3 picometers. And that lets you get a strain map with about 0.2% precision uh, from a 2D material. Obviously we'll get better precision to strain mapping when I have more atoms. Now, we're not the only people building these detectors. Ours is a little unusual in just how much current you can dump on the thing. Um, 
And in general, what's happened with these detectors is, you know, the trend is everyone's making them faster, they're adding more pixels. And so over time, the data sets get to be absolutely enormous. Um, our particular detector, as I mentioned, is notable for the huge amount of beam current it can handle. And our newest incarnation of this detector um, basically can handle more beam current than your microscope can deliver. Uh, and so we can just crank up the beam current, crank up our signal to noise ratio, or run, you know, as fast uh, or run quickly enough and outrun all the noise in the room. So uh, let me sort of give you a flavor of how do I get better resolution than the diffraction limit of the microscope? And this is an interesting exercise in what happens to a diffraction pattern when I use a very, very small electron beam, right? And intuitively, as I make my beam smaller and smaller, i.e. delta X is getting smaller and smaller, my momentum spread delta P must get bigger and bigger. And the way that manifests in a diffraction pattern is that the width of the diffraction disk gets wider and wider as the probe gets smaller and smaller, right? So think of the width of my diffraction disk as delta P, think of the position in real space as delta X and delta X delta P is a constant. So there's a trade-off. Now, if I scan my electron beam around at every position of the beam I recorded diffraction pattern, I have a four dimensional data set that is a map of phase space because I've got P, I've got X, Y, PX and PY. The diffraction plane is a very interesting plane because the diffraction plane is the Fourier transform of the object. And if I put the detector in the diffraction plane, I am going to look at the square of the wave function that's scattered outside the sample. So if I, if I think about what do I see in a normal diffraction pattern when I square up wave functions, the answer is there is no phase information because the you know, square of the wave function, I lose the phase. But when my diffraction disks overlap, something very interesting happens, right? Imagine I have here is my wave function. Here is my scattered wave function. Where the disks overlap, I have an interference term because I get psi zero plus psi scattered all squared. Writing it out explicitly, here is my unscattered beam, no phase attached to that. Here's my scattered beam, no phase attached to that. But in the overlap region, there is a phase term that has been encoded in the amplitude of the wave function because of this interference. There's a, I get the phase difference between the beams. And if I move my beam around, then I get from the Fourier shift theorem, a phase shift e to the i k delta x from the shift. And the k is of course the g vector difference of that overlap. So over here, let me take, let me show you. Here is, oh, come back. Here as I scan my electron beam around, and I look at my diffraction pattern, you see going from bright to dark in the diffraction pattern, that is phase information about the overlap of those disks. And that phase information is present in all diffracted beams that overlap with each other. So normally the information I would be working with to form an image is just that inside the central disk. And you can see now that I've effectively expanded the size of my numerical aperture by the largest scattering angle I can get useful information from. The method that, that, that unscrambles the scattering information is called tychography. And there are many ways to do it. Uh, we tend to use an iterative method um, because we can correct for a lot of aberrations at the same time when we do that. So if I, if I do my tychography, I should be able to reconstruct an image with much higher spatial resolution than you would normally. And the only other thing I wanna point out is, notice this bright spot in the center of the disk. I'm gonna come back to that later. If I, this is about the average scattering in the sample. This is, if you think about it, that's where most of my electrons are scattering. This is a map of momentum transfer. And this is telling me literally that most of my electrons, which are negatively charged, are just pointing at the nucleus of the neighboring atoms. This is just simply a plot of momentum transfer to, towards the nearest atom. 
Um, and it's measuring literally the nuclear charge. Occasionally people say silly things like, oh, I'm measuring bond charge. It turns out you're not, it's too, that's too small an effect to detect. If someone thinks I'm measuring bond charge, they're just measuring protons. Anyhow, uh, back to the useful thing, this nice diffraction experiment where I have all this diffraction information. I run that through my typography algorithm and here's the improvement in resolution I can get. Here's my annular dark field image of a twisted bilayer of MOS2. Why did I pick a twisted bilayer? Because in the twisted bilayer, the atoms take on every uh, separation from perfectly on top of each other to, well, you know, a bond length apart. And then I can use this bilayer to figure out what's the smallest resolvable distance. For my tychographic reconstruction, uh, I can go ahead and I can see atoms that are, um, you know, in this case, up to about 0.4 angstrom apart. So spatial resolution is about 0.4 angstroms. We did this at a very low beam voltage, 80 kilovolts. Nevertheless, it got us the Guinness World Record for the highest resolution image by any method at all. And, and great, this was fun for measuring twisted bilayers. But what I wanna be measuring here is thick samples because all of my ferroelectrics are thick. So this is not good enough. The model that we would use <clears throat> to do this work is what's called the strong phase approximation. And, and um, it allows for a complex scattering function, but it assumes the probe doesn't change shape. And that means the probe doesn't propagate, which is what would happen in a finite thickness sample. The effect of this is to take a 3D object and by not allowing for the change of shape of probe, I've approximated it like this. And obviously I've lost information. <coughs> So for a reasonable thickness sample, I have to do more than this. I have to account for the change of shape of the probe. In order to do that, we actually have to solve Schrodinger's equation. We have to allow for propagation of beam through the sample. And I have to allow for multiple transmission functions at every depth in the sample, propagate my beam, allow it to scatter, propagate the beam. We can use this algorithm inside our tychography loop and when we, and, and here is an illustration for a presidinium scandate. If I don't do, if I just use my strong phase approximation, I get huge phase errors and the sample looks unphysical. And if I allow for this multiple scattering to happen, then my phase shift is now linear in the thickness and my object is reconstructed at every slice. So that's great. So here's the experimental data. Here is our reconstruction of a finite thickness sample. It's about 210 angstroms thick. This is the phase retrieval. Uh, if I look at it in Fourier space, I have Fourier coefficients down to about 0.22 angstroms. And you might wonder, well, how well can I do? And what I'm showing you over here is, this is the static potential of praecedinium scandate. Once I include phonons, this is what it blows out to. And here's my experimental data. In other words, my experimental data is limited, not by the resolution of the microscope, but by the thermal blur of the atoms themselves. And in fact, when we work out by deconvolving the, the size of the atom and the thermal blur, we find out that our experimental blur is 0.1 is, is basically 16 picometers. And, and at this point, we have incredible precision for measuring the position of the atoms. And in fact, we can actually see from the asymmetry on the oxygens, right? This is scandium, that's oxygen. The oxygen atom is vibrating more perpendicular to the bond than it is along the bond. You can see that very nicely down there as well. All, all four atoms have an asymmetry. So now I can measure the by waller factors from individual atom columns in, re in real space, like at defects of grain boundaries. And in fact, because we had to do the reconstruction in 3D, you get the 3D information for free. So what I'm showing you over here is a, a gadolinium gallium garnet. And if I take a look at this region of the gadolinium gallium garnet, 
keep an eye on this interstitial place over here, um, you'll notice there is an atom that is showing up and then disappearing. There's the atom. Now it's gone. And as I come back and for as I'm all I'm doing is I'm slicing through the material. And what I'm showing you is I have a depth resolution for a, a interstitial atom. The depth resolution is about uh, three nanometers and the lateral resolution is way sub angstrom. So now we have great spatial resolution in all three dimensions. I can look for dopant atoms and we can look for displacements in ferroelectrics. So the, the last thing I wanna to touch on now is I wanna look at not individual atoms. I wanna be able to look at large areas to map out ferroelectric textures. And in particular, I'm interested in skirmions and marons. Um, you're used to seeing these things for magnets. There's the block type and the nail type. Uh, block is the sort of the in plane, the nail it goes out of plane. Um, we can see these things for magnets. Um, so magnetic skirmions are easy to see. Well, not easy, they're seeable because there's a magnetic field and the magnetic field produces a Lorentz force and I can measure my Lorentz force directly. Trying to do this for ferroelectrics is much more difficult because if I go to my kinematic theory of diffraction and I look at diffraction intensity, well, um, remember my diffraction intensity is the square of my wave function. And in the first Born approximation, that is the square of my form factor, which is the Fourier transform of my potential. And if I take the Fourier transform of my potential, uh, I'm gonna, you know, by the way, what is the Fourier transform of my potential? My potential is the electron scatters from the nucleus and it scatters from all the electrons, both valence and core electrons. So if I um, Fourier transform this object, this function, it has a very simple form for a single atom. It is the X-ray form factor minus the atomic number. Um, but in general, it's the Fourier transform of all of the nuclear charge and all of the electron charge bonds and everything thrown together. And that is my structure factor um, um, in, in a diffraction pattern. Now, the, the structure factor still holds, but in reality, I'm gonna get something that's more complicated than just the square of the structure factor. But that's the kinematic theory of diffraction. And there's a problem with this. So the quick takeaway here is remember, electrons measure the nuclear charge plus the sample electrons. X-rays are only gonna see the electrons in the sample. Now, Friedel's law is a law that says shorthand kinematic diffraction is boring uh, because kinematic diffraction will not let me see polarization. So in polarization, um, if my potential is real, then my struct, the square of my structure factor um, is uh, f of k equals f of minus k squared. In other words, my, my diffraction pattern is symmetric even if the underlying structure was not centrosymmetric, the diffraction pattern must be. In other words, I can't measure polarity of a crystal using kinematic theory. Now, here's a surprise. Here is a monolayer material, tungsten sulfide. It's a monolayer. And if you look at the diffraction pattern, it is, it is broken Friedel's rule. And the plus k and the minus k directions are, in fact, showing me a polarization vector. That, that tell me which way the polarity of the crystal is pointing. And um, if I then go ahead and I image, dark field image in this diffraction beam, uh, my tungsten sulfide lights up or you know, uh, is dark. And if I flip it, so I measure in that beam, it's bright. And I've picked a material because tungsten selenide is a lot more symmetric in its scattering intensity. So this is just showing me the flip of diffraction contrast. Why does this happen? Well, if I wrote out, even in the strong phase approximation, which is okay for a thin material, and I need block waves for a thick material, my first order term, this was the Born approximation, it has no polarity information. But as I look at the higher order scattering terms, the leading order correction is a term that's got scattering that involves effectively a V, v cubed, or if I wrote it out in Fourier space, a product, a con, 
basically effectively what's going to turn out to be a convolution of three scattering vectors. And this graphically forms a scattering path in Fourier space that is a closed path. So when I scatter in momentum space in my diffraction pattern, I pick up a phase shift and that phase shift um, over here, phi, is called the three phase invariant. And that three phase invariant, and here I'm showing you all the scattering paths that are gonna lead to why I get the difference in contrast for different types of scattering paths. That three phase invariant has a very interesting property. It's independent of the choice of the origin. So here is a measure, here is a phase shift by going around a loop in momentum space that leaves me with a phase shift. And that phase shift is independent of my choice of origin in real space. And it is sensitive to the polarization in the material. So let's take a very quick look at, um, uh, here is a lead titanate strontium titanate super lattice. Um, it in fact is arranged in a whole bunch of little polar vortices. And if I plot the difference in scattering between my plus K and minus K beam, I get a whole bunch of beautiful vortices showing up in my, my uh, momentum transfer map. And, and that's just sort of showing you as I go around the loop, you can see the diffraction changing from bright to dark. I'm running a little low on time. So I'm gonna uh, just point out very quickly, I can, um, there's a neat trick we have by using the definition of the momentum operators R cross P and being able to measure the expectation value of this thing, then, you know, here is, if here's my polarization map, here is my momentum transfer map. It tracks beautifully the polarization in the material. Um, I can, for instance, look at the orbital angular momentum transfer to the beam, and that orbital angular momentum of the beam is gonna be proportional to curl of P, which is the vorticity of this, 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 this vector flow, vorticity of the vector flow is the curl. And if I want the orbital angular momentum of the sample, that is the ferrotoroidal order parameter. And here it is as well. I can get that from looking at the, uh, the, 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 the expectation value of the quantity and the momentum transfer to the B. So that's great. Here it is. Um, here are some experimental data. Uh, showing you a beautiful structure. Um, this is all good. This all works because uh, the samples are in zone axis in reality. And in fact, every time I have continuous variation of the polarization, the sample doesn't get a chance to bend. But if I have finite domains, the sample will tilt and that sample tilt will mess up my measurement of polarization. It'll in fact, this is a warning. Some people try to use differential phase contrast measurements, which is just averaging the whole pattern together to measure momentum transfer. And what you measure is not momentum transfer. You do not say what you measure is not polarization, you just measure the tilt of the A-volt sphere. And so strontium ruthenate is not polar, but it would show up as polar. And there are several papers in literature that are wrong because this is what they've been doing. So how do we deal with this? Well, either we make sure we're on zone axis or, which is in the case for this nice, uh, smooth material here, and we've got a whole bunch of Bragg beams to check we're on axis, or we work from the Kikuchi bands, and the Kikuchi bands, their asymmetry preserves the polarization difference. They just shift. So I, as long as I find the center of the Kikuchi band and work from there, I can perfectly correct out these shifts. And so the last thing I want to show you is some freestanding uh, ferro, freestanding ferroelectrics. And if I take this freestanding film and at room temperature, we get a beautiful map of skirmions. Uh, if we cool it down, it goes into a labyrinthine phase. And if we heat it up, it actually goes into a square phase. And I'll come back to what the square phase is in a second. To figure that out, you actually have to calculate the skirmion number. And that requires 3D information not just in plane, but you also need to know what's happening out of plane. Um, and so we're able to do that. I'll show you how in a second. But what we find out is um, at low temperature, I have skirmions that are randomly arranged that give me a net chirality. 
And at high temperature, I end up with a lattice where the chirality flips in and out of plane, and it leaves me with merons. And uh, the meron is because the cores are flipping opposite to what you'd expect for the skirmion. If I only knew about the 2D structure, not the 3D, I would have mistaken this for a skirmion phase. But because of the 3D flip, and we get the 3D flip by measuring out of plane uh, changes of polarity, which we show over here, we are able to identify that we have a change in polarity of neighboring merons. Um, and if I average over a large area, there's zero net chirality. And the motivation for this is a strain driven structure. So I'm running a little low on time. Uh, so I've had to skip, I wanted, what I wanted to talk about and what I've skipped over is how do I measure higher order moments? It turns out the answer to that is in fact encoded in how higher order moments show up in your diffraction pattern intensity. Um, and in fact, we have some higher order moments uh, that in fact are present in these structures. So uh, <coughs> just given the time, let me stop um, and wrap up. Where have we got to? Um, where we can measure polarization directly in real space. Our accuracy for actually getting at interesting order parameters is limited, but we've developed new imaging methods. In this case, a tychography that gives us a spatial resolution where the spatial resolution is limited by the thermal vibrations of the atoms themselves and not the resolution of the microscope. So with this, we can get extremely precise uh, displacements of all the atoms in the material and in 3D, but the fields of view are relatively limited, right? You're looking at individual atoms. At some point, you just run out of gigabytes of data if you want to see every single atom. Secondly, we are able to measure electric and magnetic fields directly when they're present. And this is great if I have a multiferroic. And thirdly, ferroelectrics, polarization is not something that couples to the Lorentz force directly. It's, it's I'm looking at a dipole and long range that kind of canceled out. It's a higher order correction, um, but it shows up in Bragg beams and diffraction patterns. It shows up in the Kikuchi bands. That lets us map ferroelectric textures in reasonably thick samples over large areas. So now we can actually study ferroelectric order parameters that are more interesting and over large fields of view. So let me just acknowledge um, uh, uh, my, my, again, my, 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 my collaborators, uh, all of the lovely work on ferroelectric um, uh, order, the, the polarization mapping, uh, that was Yutsun Shao. The, uh, the vortices and the orbital angular momentum was Kayla. The um, uh, 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 tychography was Zhen and Yi. Uh, and Ariana has done some nice theory on the higher order moments. Uh, and then, of course, uh, beautiful ferroelectrics from Ramesh, from Daryl, from Harold Wong, working in fact with Ramesh as well and then theory and experiment on the erbium manganite uh, from Nicola and a lot of the work on merons and skirmions from Javier. And then I do want to just do a quick ad advertisement that all of these capabilities that I've talked about are accessible in our Paradigm user facility. If you go to paradigm.org, you can fill out a user proposal and uh, get time on these instruments to do these experiments. So at that point, I think I should stop and take questions. Okay, wow, that was great. That was fantastic. So everyone out there, uh, I, I have tons of questions, but everyone out there in the uh, uh, participant land can type in a question. And in principle, we can even elevate you to uh, uh, ask out loud if you have a lot of questions. Uh, so, uh, so let me, let me and, and uh, we have uh, panelists here, uh, we, we can, uh, am I, uh, Geo, can you put us on uh, kind of panelist panel mode now, please. Um, so, uh, so we can uh, keep the slides up, but, but we can have the gallery on the side. And uh, we have uh, Cyrus uh, Dreyer and uh, Laurent Palace along with me. And um, so, so uh, I, I wanna uh, just start with, um, with asking about the, um, the time resolution. So 
you were talking about thermal vibrations. Well, actually, can you identify the difference between thermal vibrations and static disorder in the positions? Is, do you have any time resolution? So uh, uh, not, not a lot of time resolution. The, the, um, I mean, what gets a little interesting uh, uh, actually, you know, gets into if you're if you think about, you remember with um, superconductors there was a static and dynamic tweed, right? And the static tweed would show up as stripes in real space, and the dynamic tweed would show up only in Fourier space. So there's a similar thing you can kind of play that game over here. Uh, it turns out with the tychography, um, there are a couple of ways to pull out if they're, oh, this is you know, something we haven't done yet, but we think we can. Um, uh, if my structure is a superposition of structures that are flopping on a reasonable, on a time scale shorter than my acquisition time, uh, we might be able to recover the superposition of structures. And, um, uh, you know, tell that I have two that I have two stable structures that I'm flipping between, rather than just an average blow. We think that's a doable thing, and I actually we're we're working through data right now to see whether or not that's working out. Um, realistically, if I'm not playing those kind of games, um, our time resolution it takes our fastest acquisition of a spectrum with enough dose to do something interesting. Um, turning out a spectrum of diffraction pattern is, uh, is about 100 microseconds. So that's my time resolution. And then if I want to make an image, I need a couple of these diffraction patterns at least. So, you know, um, think of my time resolution as a fraction, <clears throat> a fraction of a millisecond. But okay, great. Let, let me ask one question from the audience right now, and then we'll, uh, Cyrus has a bunch of uh, questions. But first, let me ask you from Ian uh, uh, McLaurin. He asks, is the polarization from the Kikuchi band's work uh, published yet? Um, <clears throat> we, have, uh, uh, we, 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 we have a paper that's been submitted. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, I think, side effects of the pandemic is it's been very hard for people to find extra time to review things. So um, things are going slowly. We'll probably put it up on archive uh, so folks can take a look at it. Okay, great, great, great. Cyrus, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, uh, thanks, me. thanks, Ron. So uh, thanks, David, uh, amazing talk. And some of the images are just, are, are really amazing. Uh, I, I had a question about the, also about the calculation of the polarization from the scattering. So, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it, 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 it sounds a lot like a, a calculation of a, a geometric phase or Berry phase, but is it correct that you were just kind of sensitive to the, uh, you know, the position and of the nuclear charges? Uh so this is why I went through all of this theory. So we are sensitive to the total electrostatic potential, mm -hmm. electrons plus nuclear charge. You can, by depending which Bragg beams you choose to look at, get to pick a little bit more of um, how much nuclear charge versus how much electron charge I'm actually looking at. So, I made a mention of this mock beta formula. <clears throat> and it's quite interpretable for a single atom. If I wrote it down for a, you know, a, a crystal that was periodic, I'd have a lot of sums involved. And it would look a little messier, but it would still have some interesting terms. Um, but intuitively, remember, the X-ray structure factor is the Fourier transform the charge density. My X-ray structure factor as Q goes to zero tends towards Z. Right, because integral of charge over all space is the number of electrons. As a result, my structure factor at small scattering angles is looking at the deviation of charge from a neutral atom. Mm -hmm. And so if I look at Bragg beams that are very, you know, the lowest order Bragg beams I've got, 
I actually can be reasonably sensitive to the valence electrons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. still not a big effect, right? It's, it's, the valence electrons are such a small fraction of everything that it's still just a couple of percent. But if I pick a low order Bragg beam, I have a good chance of getting some sensitivity to the bonding electrons as well as the nuclear charge. But most of what I'm seeing um, in, in the work that I'm showing you here is dominated by the shift of the nucleus plus the electrons around it. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a change of the dipole because I rearranged electrons, but that one is, you know, is a little harder to isolate by itself. It's in there, I'm looking at the total thing, but you know, a lot of what I'm seeing is dominated by core electrons. Mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're running out of time, but I want to follow up on that question. So, so, so can you, in principle, measure the polarization of at the atomic scale, like a, not, not the polarization of, uh, say, a unit cell or whatever, but of an atom? Can you look at the deformation of the electronic density of so, the atom? So the, the, the short answer is no, um, or at least not yet. I mean, there are people who've claimed to have done this, and they're all wrong. Um, what's happened is that um, the shape of your electron beam and the tails of that thing, those effects are much, much bigger than the small change in charge density you'd be looking for. Mm -hmm. We think we know how to do it by playing diffraction -y games, but you saw, you know, I got my resolution down to the thermal blur and nothing else. And I mm -hmm. still don't think I have the signal noise to pull out the charge density. There are people who claim to do it, and that's why, and I, and I, you know, I, I have to repeat, they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And we can actually go through DFT calculations to explain why they're wrong. And I think most of these people know that they're wrong, but are claiming this anyhow, despite knowing better. Okay. I have some questions from the audience. Uh, we're, we're, we really only have another minute. So let me uh, very quickly uh, ask. Uh, and if anyone has uh, additional questions and you, and you type them in, uh, we can uh, send them to David. He can answer you by email uh, later. Yeah. I, and I'm just going to kind of leave the second part of Cyrus's question there while the next one pops up. But yes, you should be thinking about very phases. So, so uh, one question was, can, can you implement the, uh, I'll abbreviate the question, implement the technique on on materials with nanograin sizes, thin, thin films with nanograin sizes? Yes. Uh, I mean, in some sense, we've done even better than nanograins. We've done mm -hmm. continuously varying right, stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. but, but the Kikuchi band mm -hmm. approach is incredibly robust, particularly mm -hmm. for nanograins. Mm -hmm. um, and, if, and, if grains have random orientation, that's a lot more difficult, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if it's polycrystalline with truly random orientation, then I can't find a Kikuchi band that's going to be interesting enough. So um, two more quick questions, and then we're going to have to have to. I'll have one closing slide. But from uh, Mauro uh, Locatelli, uh, he asks if if the uh, electron beam can actually change the polarization in the sample. Uh, yes, it can, um, and uh, that's some work we're actually doing with Laurent. Um, so I didn't show that today, okay. um, but, but we can indeed, uh, you know, your electron beam is charged. Um, if I get to, you know, it can couple basically to surface charge like mm -hmm. things, uh, you know, in the middle of the, mm -hmm. if I'm in the middle of a domain, it's going to be very boring. Mm -hmm. But if I'm mm -hmm. at the domain boundary, you can do all sorts of interesting things if there's a- We're, we're over. So just very quickly, you know, uh, Ponomareva asks, if it's possible to reconstruct the three-dimensional displacement pattern? Uh, eventually, um, you'd have to, I think we'd have to do more than, we'd have to image it at more than one tilt. Um, but we've come close to that. In fact, when I showed you that discussion of the chirality of the Meron, uh, mm -hmm. we were using diffraction information out of the plane and that gave us 3D information with unit cell kind of resolution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let me just put up, thank you so much. That was, that was fantastic. Let me just put up a, a, a closing slide about our series. I, everybody uh, uh, is very appreciative, David. That was fantastic uh, talk. I, I think we all learned a lot. And if you have further information, uh, questions, you can read his papers and, or send uh, emails, or even if you type in the uh, question period, there's a uh, panel now, those will get sent to him.
So uh, I want to uh, uh, mention the next uh, talk in our series is by uh, Cyrus Dreyer at uh, Stony Brook uh, University and at the um, uh, uh, and he's going to talk about non-adiabatic born effective charges in metals and the Drood weight on uh, June 10th. And uh, we want to thank all of you for uh, joining. Uh, and so please uh, uh, join us for the next lecture. And uh, thank you very much to the organizing committee. And thank you especially to David for a uh, very nice talk. So with that, we will sign off. Thank you. Bye-bye.